So friendly reminder, everything is always in Schoology, just like the node practices, all of that. Um, so I asked you to pull up your unit five lesson three classes. Um, let me pause this in case it shows an All right, but you could always work ahead in Schoology if I ever have them published. Um, usually they're made a few weeks in advance. You just may not know how to do a particular problem on there until we get to that lesson. So you're always welcome to ask. Tutoring is supposed to start the 25th, but it looks like they're scheduling me at a meeting like the town. So I may have, I might have to move that. I'll just have to see when it gets closer to the date. Um, but keep in mind, like any questions so far that you've been having, since there's not tutoring yet, you need to be asking in class. And we're not too far in. We're only like three lessons in. We'll do lesson four today. Um, but like lesson four practice is already in there. So just look through the work ahead as we need it. Um, so on the practice from yesterday, which, if any, were like the most difficult? I'll just use some of those as an example. One, three. Okay, so yesterday I showed you this formula towards the end of class. Let me pull up that worksheet again. Um, and then I actually printed, I'd already had it printed, but I printed the paper and now you have it too. So one of the papers that you picked up today, the one that says exponential growth, on it, um, that goes with this practice. So the questions are exactly the same. This is what I want. Okay. But I want you to use that paper as kind of like your notes because even though the lesson kind of covers the same thing, it doesn't cover it as much as directly as what I'm about to show you. So, all right, this paper that you have in front of you, the exponential growth formula that I had you write down yesterday, just on your notes, write it down again on this paper that looks like this. So y equals a parentheses one plus r close parentheses to the t power. What did a stand for? What, so it's not, A does not stand for time. Which one is for time? T. Okay, good. So the exponent is always representing time because we're looking at exponential growth or decay. So stuff that either grows at a really fast rate over time or decreases at a really fast rate over time. So how much time has passed will tell you like what amount you have or whatever it is. So that's why the time is always the exponent. But what would the A be? The initial amount or starting amount, whatever you want to call it. But that will always be like a constant. So not with a variable, not with an exponent. And then what did the R represent? Growth rate. Growth rate, good. Special thing about the growth rate, it has to be written as good. So if it gives you it as a percent, just make sure you convert it to a decimal before putting it in your problem. Um, and then in case I didn't say it while the recording was on, this goes with your 5.3 puzzle piece practice in Schoology. The questions are the same for the most part. Um, so there. Yesterday, we looked at a few examples, like one of them was 500 times 2 to the T, right? 500 was the starting amount of bacteria, so that is why it's in the A position, it's a constant. Um, usually, this will already have been added together, whatever's in parentheses. So like yesterday, the bacteria doubled every hour. So that's why it was a two. Basically, if it's bigger than one, it's gonna be growth. That's why it's one plus something, because it's one or it's big. 
And then T, like we said, is time every hour you plug into the T and you get however many bacteria for that hour. So then when you do problems that are like on your practice that talk about different things, like in number one, which so this is the same as the puzzle piece. What is my starting amount? The 1400, good. So then you put that in the A position. So original value and investment is 1400. What's the growth rate? 9%, but I don't want to put plus 9 in there. What would I put in there? 0 0.09, because it has to be written as a decimal. Do, do you know how to convert any percent into a decimal? Good. I think that's the easiest way. Other people will say, like, move the decimal to the left, right, two times. I always forget if it's left or right. So I just think of it as divide by 100%. And that'll get you the correct decimal. And then the T will be time. What is T going to be? Twenty five years. So all the information will be in the problem, or at least enough will be in the problem to solve. Um, and then Y would be like whatever this equals. So why would be the value after that many years? So because everything on the right side is numbers, I can go ahead and throw that into my calculator. You can put in Desmos. Um, your homework also has a calculator, which isn't too bad to use. I just wouldn't recommend like a phone calculator because phone calculators only let you put things in one at a time. This one lets me put in everything at once. And if you put things in one at a time, you have to know your order of operations then. But otherwise, I put it in like this. So everyone look at it. You see like how it's formatted. And then you press equals. And that's my answer. Now, we're talking about money in this problem. So what should I probably round to? The hundredth place, so two decimal points. Would it be, or two spots after the decimal, I should say. Will it be 0 0.31 or 0 0.32? 0 0.31, according to our rounding rules. And then the first part of that is 12,072. There we go. Questions about that? All right, and then that best matches your answer option B, or it might be shuffled. So in the first hour it was D, the second hour or third hour now it's this. So just find the correct amount. Questions on that? So yeah, in the lesson, it's more like discovery, like they really want you to remember it um, or like discover it, I guess you could say. The Practice is a little more straightforward because I pulled it from a different resource. These questions are more like what you'll see on your unit test, so that's why I chose it. All right, now let's look at another problem. I'm going to pick problem three because I think it's a good example. So try problem three on your practice, which is also the same problem three that's on your paper. So if for some reason you don't want to, I don't know, pull up your puzzle piece, even though it's right in front of you, or maybe your phone book's not working, um, just take the notes on your paper and then put it in your puzzle piece later. But try three on your own. All right, so Number of student athletes at a local high school is 300 and increasing at a rate of 8% per year. Use an exponential function to find the number of student athletes after five years. So is this increasing over time or decreasing over time? Increasing. So we're going to use the growth formula. You don't know the decay formula yet, but you'll see when we get there why I asked that. So here's that growth formula. 
What do I put for the A? 300, because A is for initial amount. 300 is how many they started with. Um, keep following the formula. So parentheses, one plus the growth rate as a decimal. 8% as a decimal is good. And then to the T power, the time frame we're looking at is five years for this one. All right, same thing as before, put it in your calculator. So 300 parentheses, and sometimes you'll see it where it's already added together. So like the 1.08 is what they might have in there. Either way, if it's bigger than one, it must be growth. And then for the power of five. So just like that equals, and then I get a decimal. But are we talking about money in this one? No. What are we talking about? Can I have a decimal of a student? So what do we think the answer is going to be? So the debate is 440 or 441. Um, now, the data doesn't support us having a whole nother student. It supports us having 0.79 eight of a student, which is not possible. So even though like following normal rounding rules, you would think like it's 441, but it's not, okay? So in these situations where you're counting like people or things that can't be decimals, you just automatically round down to the whole number. So I know that's weird because ordinarily you round up if it's 0.7, but not in this case, but it's people. Make sense? All right, so then you would type in 440 into number three. All right, so just wanted to address that because sometimes I feel like even though the lessons are good and it'll help you like learn or remember things long-term, sometimes like when you're given an actual math problem, you just need like a little bit more direct instruction to solve it. So that's why I pulled that up. Um, we're going to move on to today's lesson. Any questions before we move on? All right, so we're on lesson four. The goal for today is to look at exponential decay now, so things that would decrease over time. Um, we're going to attach it to some vocabulary, so like knowing what exponential growth and exponential decay mean and writing expressions that it's decaying instead of growing. I did, I'm recording the lesson right now, but I do have a video from last year. If you want to check that out, um, of course, just like skip probably the first chunk of it and then you'll get to an actual lesson. Um, but I'll provide those when I find them. Otherwise, YouTube is a great resource. You can probably look up any subject that we cover and there's probably videos already made. And then the puzzle piece is lesson four. And your next quiz will be after lesson seven. Now, I know some of you were absent yesterday and or you might have had trouble with Schoology yesterday and so you need to take your quiz. I'll make those polls when I find it convenient. Um, otherwise, like make sure we're using the quizzes as what they're meant for. So make sure once I do open it up for viewing, it's probably not viewable yet because not everyone's taking it. Um, but once I do open it for viewing, look at how you did and submit test corrections. Like you can even do those from home just on a piece of paper, redo the problem, show your work, explain why it was wrong, and then I'll give you half credit back. Um, that's what it's for, is like a checkpoint before you take your unit test. Because really in the grand scheme of things, like quizzes aren't very much points once we have unit tests in there. So again, make sure we're using it. Very Otherwise, I'm not too concerned about how many people to take a quiz. I'll pull you when there's like time in class when you're doing like in class. Questions? 
Um, so any percentage, like 9% divided by 100%, oh, that's the decimal. Or like if it was 80%, divide that by 100%, now that's the decimal, things like that. Um, also, while we're talking about that, yesterday when that number with the exponent was 2, it was because it was doubling, or in other words, growing by 200%, which then when you divide that by 100%, it's 2. So that's why just if the number with the exponent is bigger than 1, you know it's growing. All right. So then... On to lesson four. Um, the warm up is a notice and wonder, and I don't want to spend like too much time. So just once you look at it, give me probably 30 seconds of think time, and then I'll just take volunteers for notice and wonder. If it's not drag it out, I want you to have time to practice later. All right, so here's the notice and wonder. Look at the two tables. Quietly for about 30 seconds, and then I'll call for volunteers for what you notice and what you wonder. Mm -hmm. Someone raise your hand and tell me something that you notice. Brian? There's fractions in the Y-value. There's fractions in the Y-value. All right, anything else we notice? Try again. In both tables. So there's mixed numbers in table A. Brandon? Table B has different denominators in the fraction. I'm gonna abbreviate. All right, anything else you notice? And that's a pretty good start. I already doing a little better than my first hour of that. I just didn't couldn't find anything. Um, what about like, are they increasing over time? Are they decreasing? Up. Right into that. Right? For table A, all the white values, the whole table increases and they go down. Okay, so table A increases. Does table B increase or decrease class? Okay, Brian says it increases. What did you say, Julian? I think it decreases. So let's see. These are fractions. How would we describe these fractions? They're improper fractions, meaning that the top is bigger than the bottom. So are they smaller than one? No, they're all bigger than one if it's an improper fraction. So let's see if it's actually increasing or decreasing. So I'll pull up a calculator. Okay, we changed our mind. So, so let's see. So like nine divided by two is 4.5. That is bigger than the three. Um, 27 divided by four is 6.75. The last one, 81 divided by eight is 10.125. So it is increasing. They both are increasing. All right, now what are some things that we wonder? Here, let's try something different. Usually the things you wonder are never wrong. So maybe that encourages you to participate. Um, table one, what's something we wonder? Um, 
usually what I wonder is like, what are these tables for? So what is it for? All right, anything else we wonder? What do they mean, the X's and the Y's? What's my input, what's my output? Um, usually there's no wrong answers for what we wonder, but um, let's see what the book says as far as things you guys didn't say. So, sorry, I lost my page. So some notices are that both tables start with the same coordinate, right? They do, they both start with zero two. Um, in the table A, they differ by the same amount each time. Each time they're adding 1.5. In table B, does it add the same amount each time? No, and you know, because here it's plus one and then all of a sudden it's like, I don't even know what the difference is from here to here, but it's definitely not plus one because then it would be four. Um, so not by the same amount. Is there a pattern in table B that anyone notices? All right, there is a pattern. Instead of adding the same amount each time, they are multiplying by the same amount each time. And what they're multiplying by is 3.2. So each time it is, or not 3.2, times 3 over 2, and that's how we're getting the next one. Um, in table A, the Y values started out as bigger than table B, but then eventually table B exceeded it. So that means that when you add the same amount each time versus when you multiply the same amount each time, which one is usually growing at a faster rate, the adding or the multiplying? So keep that in mind too. Um, their wonders are like, is there a simple pattern for table B? Will the Y values ever be the same again? Will they stay pretty close to each other? That's just what the book says. All right, now here's today's activity. That's printed on your paper. So Diego has a hundred dollars and spends a fourth of it. How much does he have left? Just tell me. What does he have left? Twenty-five or seventy-five? Seventy-five. Seventy-five is what he has left. Oh. And here's one way to think about it. So first, you probably thought to yourself, what is one-fourth of 100? So what's one-fourth of 100? Good. That's probably what you did first. You realize that this is 25. And then you subtracted it from the 100. And that's how you got your answer as far as what's left. Um, so that's what they're showing you here. This part is kind of weird to me. Anyone know how they went from step one to step two? They actually did the distributive problem. I feel like most of us know or can figure out that one fourth of 100 is 25 and just go from there. But they actually distributed that negative to both numbers. I don't know, kind of weird, but that's what they did. Um, and then they figured out also that another way to find out the answer was to think of it more this way, where if he spent a fourth of it, how much does he have left? Like fraction wise. So three fourths is what he has left. And then if you do three fourths times 100, that equals what? 75. So yes, the answer is 75 for what he has left. You could either figure out what one fourth is, subtract it from the 100, or just figure out 
how much does he have left as a fraction and multiply it by the 100. All right, so think of that when I ask you this next question with your groups. So a person makes 1800 per month, but a third of that amount goes to her rent. What two numbers can you multiply to find out how much she has after paying her rent? And then after that, try number three, write an expression that only uses multiplication and that is equivalent to X reduced by one eighth of it. Try that, make sure everyone in your group knows the answer and how to explain it because we'll make a reporter here in a little bit. All right, so remember, if you don't know the answer or, I don't know, just don't want to give the answer, that's fine. It doesn't give you off the hook. I can always ask you more questions. Um, so just keep that in mind. Don't just tell me I don't know until you get out there. The reporter right now will be whoever in your group has the straightest hair. Figure that out. <laughs> If you need a tiebreaker, just you know, figure it out real quick and quietly. Um, we will start with table three. So table three, whoever the reporter is. Um, did you figure out what two numbers you can multiply to find out how much she has after paying her rent? All right, so we have not figured it out. Um, what is she starting with? Still table three. Mm -hmm. And how much of it is going to her rent? So instead of doing like figuring out what a third of 1800 is and then subtracting it, it wants you to figure out what you can multiply to get the same answer. Um, look back at the problem we did before. If one third of it is going to her rent, how much remains table three? Just like the fraction? Two thirds, thank you. All right, that's fine. Um, two thirds of it remains. Over here, you see how we took what remained and times it by the starting amount? And we got the answer. So here, I would just have to take my starting amount times the fraction that remains. And that's the answer. All right, I know like sometimes you're like, what the heck are they looking for? Even I ask that myself sometimes. But it wants you to not just think of decreasing as subtraction, but also by multiplying a fraction that's smaller than one. Mm -hmm. All right, questions on that? So that answers it. These are the two numbers you can multiply to find out how much she has after paying her rent. Um, times it by one third, we'll study how much her rent is. But we wanna know how much she has after. Now, number three. So table eight, if I want to find an expression that's equivalent to X reduced by one eighth of X, if we're taking away one eighth of it, what remains table eight? Seven eighths. Seven eighths. And how would I make that? I don't know. Do we know what X is? Like, do we know what the value of X is anywhere in this problem? So this is a different problem than number two. So we don't know. It just has it as X. So guess what we're going to do with it if it wants us to multiply it? Put it as times X. All right, that's really it. So instead of writing x reduced by 1 eighth, instead of doing x minus 1 eighth of x, they want you to write this, which is equivalent, timesing it by what remains. All right, questions on that? 
Now compare that to the growth that we did a few examples of earlier. The constant always represented what in the growth formula? We can look at it. So here's the one for growth. What did the constant always represent? The initial, the initial amount. So if you're, because I got a delayed response, a constant is a number without any variables or like anything attached to it. So that would be my constant. My constant is my starting amount. Is that true for like these? Is that my starting amount? Yes. Um, and then it's being times by what in the growth rate? Or I'm sorry, I gave the answer away. It's being times by whatever it's growing by, the growth rate. Well, guess what? In here, it's being times by whatever it's decreasing by. All right, or in this case, it's what remains. So it's being times by something that's smaller than one. So I'm gonna give you a formula and you're gonna write it on your paper. I'm gonna give you the decay formula. We're gonna put exponential decay. So the exponential decay formula is going to be y equals a parentheses one minus r close parentheses to the t power. All right, have you seen something similar to this before? What does it look like? It looks really similar to the growth formula. It even uses the same variables. The variables do mean the same thing. Um, but what's the only difference between this decay formula and the growth formula? Good. Instead of doing one plus R in the decay, it's one minus R, which really just means that whatever has the exponent on it will be smaller than one. And then it's, you know, it's decay versus growth. All right. So questions on that? That's, the, that's why we have fractions today. I know you don't like fractions that much, but if it's smaller than one, it's decaying, decreasing. All right, next page. So every year after a car is purchased, it loses a third of its value. Um, and that's a real life scenario. I don't know what it loses like what fraction it loses by, but this is a good example. So let's say that a new car costs 18,000. The buyer worries that the car will be worth nothing in three years. Do you agree or disagree? Talk about that with your group for a second. If it's losing a third of its value, will it be worth nothing in three years? All right, raise your hand if you think it will be worth nothing in three years. Raise your hand if you disagree. Okay, so of those that participated, I'd say it's like two thirds think it will be worth nothing and the other third thinks it will be worth something. Um, I had a 1999 Chevy Prism as my first car. I forget when I sold it, but it was probably like 2016 when I sold it for $2,000. So it still was worth something even after all that time. It wasn't just worth nothing. So the answer is it will be worth something. And here's why. Um, so here's what it starts with at year zero. After one year, how much is it worth? 12,000. Um, you could have done 18,000 times the one third and then subtracted it, but try to get in the habit of doing that multiplying like we just did. So here to get this, we did 
18,000 times two thirds, and that tells you how much it's, it's still worth, not what it lost. Um, now, what's two thirds of 12,000? Eight thousand is what it's worth at year two. So you're taking whatever it current its current value is, and then times it by the two thirds. So here we did twelve thousand times two thirds, or you could do this. So that's basically what we did. So we'll give you the same amount. So this is twelve thousand. This is twelve thousand times two thirds. Make sense? All right, fill out the rest of your table with your group, the three, six, and T years. So get the T years, all right, right out. Okay, so we have I'll give you like less than two minutes. All right, so same reporter as before, at least for the moment. Um, table two, what is the value of the car at year three? I need a calculator. I don't think I mean, we might be able to do it in your But keep the pattern going. So each year we're multiplying it by an additional two thirds. So take like the previous year, so like year two, it was worth this much. And then we times it by another two thirds. Or take the 8,000 times by two thirds to get flat. Did nobody get it? So you get a decimal. Since we're talking about money, let's um, hold on. Um, since we're talking about money, let's round to two decimal spots. So that would be 5,333.33. Now, what about year six? Anyone have that? Jalen? And what did you do to get there? Did you just multiply another two thirds? So would this be year six though, class? That would be year four. Because the table kind of skipped. So same thing as yesterday. Remember it skipped from three to six. So you have to figure out the pattern and then keep it going. How could I like condense the times two thirds, times two thirds, times two thirds? How could I rewrite it? Yeah, so instead of writing times two thirds like six times, I could write it as times two thirds to the power of six. Same like how here I could have wrote it as to the power of three, to the power of two, to the power of one. I could do that instead of times being two thirds. Does that make sense? Kind of like how we did yesterday. Um, except for yesterday it was double times by two. Yeah. So then the two will take your starting amount. Times by two thirds to the six. And I feel like I might have, I did not put two thirds. Hold on. Is that what you guys got? Okay, that sounds right. It's only the second time I've done it today. So.
So it's fifteen hundred eighty dollars and twenty five cents when we round it to two stations. Sorry, I just wanted to see if it would change. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to see if putting the parentheses there or not made it change, um, and it didn't. So 1580.25 is what we have at year six. Now, the part where it's year T is supposed to be an expression or an equation that can help us find it when it's any value of T. So even like after 100 years, which it'll probably not be worth anything after 100 years, but... What equation would I write? What's the only thing that changes each time when we go down the table? The exponent. So if my input is t, where is that t going to go? And the exponent spot where like all the other numbers were going. So then this one down here is 18,000 times two-thirds to the t power. That will let you find it for any amount of time that's passed. That is also your answer for number three, except for it wants it to be equal to v, which is the value of the car after that many years. And then it wants you to solve in number four for V when T is zero. So where do you plug in the zero? Into the T, so do that. We'll do it together. I don't think I need to give you time for that. What did you say, Julie? So what's my final answer going to be? When T is zero. The 18,000 is correct because anything to the zero power is one. So then 18,000 times one is. So when T is zero, which is also in your table, that means no time has passed. That's your starting amount of its value. And it's usually your starting amount when T is zero. Good. Um, now, Apply that to number five. So now a different car is losing value at a different rate. It's identified by this equation, which is probably easier to see on your paper what that fraction is. In your groups, explain what the numbers 10,000 and four fifth mean in this situation. So real quick, yes. All right, table five, what does the 10,000 represent? Value of the car when? <clears throat> the initial value of the car. So like the starting value of the car. Table six, what does the four fifth represent? So yes, kind of. Like usually what's in the parentheses is your decay rate. But is it losing four fifths of its value every year? What is it losing every year? So the four fifths represents the value that remains, I guess you could say. And I know I didn't ask what one fifth represents, but one fifth is how much it is losing each year. All right, but the four fifths is what we'd actually multiply to get whatever its current value is. 
All right, good. Any questions? So, and also if I'm tying it back to that formula that I showed you, so I'll put it back on this when we're done. Um, what it's decaying by, so that R would be decay rate, what it's decaying by is one fifth. So one minus one fifth is four fifths, right? That's why it's times the four fifth, um, and that's why it has that exponent on the four fifth. All right, good. So I'll leave this up in case some of you are still writing. You have the remaining class time to do your lesson four puzzle piece or really any other puzzle pieces that aren't done yet. The Mercury doesn't start until next week. Is it next week? I don't know. No. Um, or the week after. I don't know. Whenever the 25th is or around that time. So today was lesson four. Feel free to ask questions and or email me if you have questions, but don't just wait for class to be over. Like I'm leaving the talk. Yeah.